And of course, you know, in most of our patients who have intact immune system and very well preserved immune system, the tumor still can grow despite a perfectly working immune system. And it is because the tumor can create this immunosuppressive envir uh, environment, which you see on this, or here on these pictures. I'm not going to go through every single cell line. I'm trying to show the complexity of this, then, and then this leads to the possible overcoming of this um, tumor environment by activating the cells, the cells within the tumor environment by offering in, uh, intratumoral therapies. So, um, as you see, multiple cells can be involved in the uh, eye modulation and activation of immune responses in the, in the tumor. Therefore, uh, different therapies might be used to uh, intratumoral therapies to activate this, uh, the system and hopefully achieve, um, uh, achieve uh, anti-tumor response. Um, so far, we have not been extremely successful with our, with our therapies, I have to say. As far as I'm aware, there's only one agent, definitely one agent in melanoma, but I think it's one agent in all cancers, but it's currently approved as an intratumoral therapy, and this is, and this is Talimogen Lacher Parebvek. But, um, it, so I'm talking mainly about futures and past failures in, during, this, during this presentation. So, We've, we've be, we, people do recognize that maybe intralesional therapy can be of help, so people try to use intralesional, uh, intralesional chemotherapy. Oh my God. Hmm. Now, and in melanoma, there was, you know, Rose Bengal gave about, you know, ten, uh, gave quite a significant number of responses, but the responses were very short-lived. That's why it didn't stay with us. In the past, we were using bleomycin cisplatin, injection of bleomycin into um, smaller squamous carcinomas or Kaposi sarcomas is still a method of treatment. Um, for localized disease, but uh, with a very uh, limited uh, systemic effect. So that's why there was more interest in development of on, uh, oncolytic viruses, and the majority of these viruses are based on a herpes virus, type 1. And you, um, Greg Daniels already talked to you about the principles of onco uh, oncolytic virus therapies, where uh, the virus is injected into the tumor, has the ability to proliferate within the cancer cells, and infect surrounding cells, but does not necessarily infect normal cells, and this leads to release of antigen, immune activation within the tumor, and hopefully this release of antigen improves antigen presentation and uh, can give you systemic uh, responses. So, as I mentioned, the only therapy right now approved is a therapy of Talimogen Lacher Parebvek, um, this therapy um, was approved based on this clinical trial when inject intratumor injections, and these are done by a physician, so the tumors must have been either on the, on the surface or palpable lymph nodes, and this was compared to uh, GMCSF. It had a very strange, it had a very strange uh, primary endpoint, which was a durable risk. So it's not only responses, but they, once they responded, they must have been durable and it's improved over GMCSF. And still, it is an, act, it is an active drug and used in several, in, in the clinic in melanoma in several patients, not in everybody. It, there was a small improvement in overall survival, which had a, a borderline significance. But unfortunately, when we, people took it to the next level, I said, okay, we are going to right now uh, com combine it with PD-1 blocking antibody in this clinical trial with pembrolizumab, with patients which have pembrolizumab either with TVEC or placebo. As you can see, um, there was really no improvement in progression-free survival and definitely no improvement in overall survival. So TVEC remains an approved for limited patient population, but generally speaking, um, the development of the drug really stopped in this place. So there are new drugs, and we already heard about this drug in, in, for the use in patients with uh, after organ transplant in patients with skin cancer, different skin cancers. 
Um, here I'm presenting the data which we presented to ASCO on Vuzoli margin other parebvec, another herpes virus modification improved where patients uh, whose um, disease progressed on PD-1 blocking antibody, they continued on PD-1 blocking antibody in this clinical trial, it was nivolumab, but they were also uh, uh, getting intratumoral injections of, um, of a virus, up to eight injections. And um, uh, but most importantly, you, you could also inject in visceral organs, so not only not only skin lesions or palpable lymph nodes, but also liver lesions or lung lesions were injected on this clinical trial. So these are the results. The results, I'm not going to go, to go too much in detail, but as you can see, the response rate in all 91 patients, right now we have 130 patients, but in June it was presented 91 patients, was 37.4%. These are, again, as a reminder, these were patients whose disease previously progressed on PD-1 blocking antibodies. If you look at other columns, some patients were treated all in the past only with PD-1 single agent. Some patients were treated with PD-1 CTLA-4 blocking antibody. The response rate was generally in the same, in the same range. So um, because of this, res uh, uh, and on this graph you can see when responses with the red lines are injected lesions, the blue lines are non-injected lesions, it is the most probably the most important part of this clinical trial when you see a similar pattern of responses in both injected and non-injected lesions. Because it is not necessarily surprising when injected lesions respond to your local therapy, but we know when this is a metastatic disease, so we need really a systemic uh, we need really a systemic response. And of course, there's an, uh, examples of a patient when this uh, a forehead lesion was injected, but then these yellow circles show you non-injected lesions, and this patient had a response uh, in the liver. Similarly, here, subcutaneously or soft tissue lesions were injected, but there was a response uh, in the lesions in the lungs. So, uh, of course, you know, this is very exciting. Right now we're working, it's a very soon a confirmatory trial will be open when patients in the similar setting will be randomly assigned either to nivolumab uh, uh, RP1 combination or investigator's choice for now. The protocol has not been finalized, so I'm not gonna uh, tell much more. But definitely the confirmatory trial is needed, as we saw, we already we have experience with pembrolizumab, talimod, and lahar pareb combination. The other one was a first-line trial. Here we're going to do only this clinical trial in resistant patients. What about intralesional cytokines? Um, so there has been an interest in one of the probably that was uh, the developed, the, the development was more advanced, was actually interleukin-12. Um, interleukin-12, when given systemically, has a significant toxicity, cannot be given systemically, so uh, the company came up with this electroporation uh, uh, device when IL-12 was intro, inter, uh, uh, electroporated into the tumor, and again, the tumoral uh, uh, treated lesions responded, but also there was, there was a systemic response in untreated lesions. So the company took it to a larger trial when uh, the, the drug was combined with pembrolizumab. Unfortunately, the response rate um, to this therapy was only 10%. Uh, this trial was stopped and the company doesn't exist anymore. Having said that, there is still interest in interleukin-12. Actually, we are working on a new clinical trial when we will be in a different method. We'll be delivering, delivering combination of interleukin-12 and interleukin-2 intratumorally. We are about to open the first in human trial in the day. So in the past, we also was interested in injecting, it's an old slide from an older paper, in the injecting of interleukin-2. And again, we see that all these injectable therapies work, just they work in a small number of patients, so it's very difficult for us to identify the most appropriate candidate, the most appropriate candidates for, inter, for intralesional therapy. 
As I mentioned, you know, we will have this combination of IL-2, IL-12 intratumorally. We will also, uh, there is also interest in development of interleukin-15, which is, the, which is uh, um, related to interleukin-2, and we are also about to open a first in human uh, trial of interleukin, of special formulation of interleukin-15 in, in uh, solid malignancies. You might have heard or not, it's not in my slides, but uh, recently there was a new, uh, there was a new adjuvant trial, which were just the press release was about two weeks ago, of combination of interleukin-2 and tumor necrosis factor. In patients with melanoma, we don't know the fully the details, but it says that there was improvement in relapse free survival over placebo. Um, so we'll see where it, you know, uh, when we might have uh, finally a positive trial. Another, another uh, drugs which are of interest are uh, therapies that can activate innate immune agonists, and mainly here we are using TLR9 agonists. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the results of the trial which was also performed at UCLA in patients, again, with PD-1 blocking antibody with a drug called Vidutolimab. It's an TLR9 agonist. Um, we saw uh, 44 patients were treated, and in the resistance setting, we saw 25% response rate. Again, injected, non-injected lesions were uh, uh, responding. Here, we were not doing visceral injections, so only subcutaneous lesions were injected. And we did some uh, a more detailed analysis showing when we can reactivate the pathways and we can uh, attract T cells into a tumor environment. I'm not showing the slides. Uh, but um, I want to pr bring again, to put into perspective, we had also another promising drug called Tilsotolimod. Uh, again, TR TLR9 agonists, when initial trials show a response is about 22%. It was taken to the randomized clinical trial of ipilimumab alone or ipilimumab plus tilsotolimod, and unfortunately, the response rates in both arms were identical, and this was the end of this, of this therapy. We have another TLR9 agonist when we were running a clinical trial at UCLA right now. It's SD101. We had a clinical trial in patients with, uh, with um, cutaneous melanoma, similar to the previous one I discussed. Here, right now, we are trying to do with a new form of delivery of SD101 to uh, liver metastasis of uveal melanoma. We know that uveal melanoma is a much more resistant to immunotherapy is generally called a cold tumor, um, and um, so we hope that by TLRN uh, uh, stimulation and delivering to the liver directly, we can improve immune response. It's given in combination either with nivolumab or nivolumab and ipilimumab. So this is, I, I ran through all these therapies. I talked only about melanoma. There are efforts on development in other cancers too. But still, there are some questions and challenges. So, um, so obviously, uh, we haven't. We see responses. We see resp uh, We know that it can work, but still, we don't. There's only one agent that's approved, and one could argue that maybe the responses were not so great. So we don't know how to. Still, we don't. We don't have a very good biomarkers for. Uh, and to very good mechanisms to, to identify the, the mechanism of progression of PD-1 blocking antibodies. In all these trials, there's not enough biopsies done to compare before and after the response rate. We don't have a very good predictive biomarkers to, to, to direct our therapy. Also, you know, although we are injecting the tumor, we assume that every tumor is the same, and we right now, these days, we know that it's not only the type of a tumor, but also location in which organ it is. We may have a different responses in the liver, which is usually more in immunoinhibitory uh, environment. The lung responses might be better. Adrenal glands are known to be resistant to, immune, to, to, to immunotherapies. We actually don't even know how to correctly dose these drugs. Should we rather dose based on tumor burden or deliver the same dose of a, of a drug into each patient? And um, so should the dose be adjusted to larger tumor version or 
uh, tumor burden or should be the fixed dose. So still, there is a lot of questions. Luckily, there are developments. Hopefully, the future should be when we run smaller trial before we go to a larger random mass trial. We try to figure out the biology before we try to enroll hundreds of patients in for a negative trials. But um, that's it. All right, so our next speaker is Anusha Kalbaski, who's uh, Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology at Stanford, um, and he's gonna give us a talk about adoptive cell therapies for solid tumors, please. Uh, thanks, Larry, and thanks to the organizers. <clears throat> Get this a little bit higher, there we go. Okay, so I'm actually surprised that we've gotten this far today and we haven't talked about uh, T cell therapy for solid tumors all that much yet, so that, that's a good thing. Um, so here are my disclosures. So for the next 15 minutes, what I'm gonna talk about are three major approaches to T cell therapy, and I, I hope I don't have to convince you that T cells are the most important cell of the immune system, um, and they're the ones that are mediating the most profound responses that we have in immunotherapy to date. So while there's a lot of excitement about other cell types, I'm gonna focus that uh, this talk on T cells. There are three forms of therapy that I'll talk about till TCR-based therapy and CAR te therapy. Uh, I'm gonna highlight some of the challenges and recent failures in each of these modalities, and then uh, a peek into a couple of the innovative uh, strategies in the, in the pipeline. So uh, as T cells are the most important cell, uh, the um, T cell receptor MHC interaction is at the center of that. Um, and when we think about PD-1 therapies, we know that we're modifying the biology of the T cell, but the PD-1 therapies don't actually modify the biology of this interaction. This interaction is intact, um, and we're depending on a natural interaction that's happening in hosts uh, independent of that drug. When a T cell becomes activated and identifies its target in the cancer cell, it releases granzyme and perforin, which allows it to kill the T cell, also other effector molecules like interferon gamma and TNF-alpha that potentiate that effect. Question is, where are these T cells in a patient with cancer? Um, and where can we find them? Can we actually harness the cells themselves and use them as a therapy? And this has been an idea that's been around for decades and decades. And one of the logical ideas is that the the T cells that are most likely to be found in a patient with cancer that are gonna recognize the cancer are within the tumor itself. And so if you remove that tumor and then plate it on, in a culture dish and try to grow it in IL-2, which is a T cell growth factor, uh, you may be able to grow enough of these T cells uh, to use as a therapy. And this is TIL therapy in short, and you need to infuse about a billion or more cells, sometimes 100 billion cells in order to have an effect. And for those of you not familiar with the scale of that, CAR T cells, as an example, can be effective at doses, at doses as low as 10 to 50 million cells. So a billion is a lot. Why do you need so many cells? Well, it's probably because not all the cells in the tumor, our T cells in the tumor, are gonna be actually reactive to the tumor itself. Uh, there are passenger T cells within the tumor that you may expand. There's uh, T cells that are specific for viruses, for example, that you can expand. But the idea is still the same, that naturally occurring tumor-specific T cells are most likely to be found in the tumor. And this is a summary of TIL therapy. The source of the therapy is the tumor itself. You grow it out uh, uh, in a T cell biased fashion and then use those T cells, which are not requiring any type of genetic engineering, and then throwing them back into the patient. The interesting premise of this is it's kind of like flying blindly because you actually don't know what you're targeting in the cancer and you don't know what you're targeting it with. So you don't know what the T cell receptor is and you don't know what the antigen is. You're just trusting the system. You're trusting the system that the T cell can recognize the cancer. And the first study of this pilot study in 1988, and we were discussing at lunch, this was around the era of gold, the golden era of immunology, but uh, this was the first, uh, one of the first pilot studies of TIL therapy. Um, and so it tells you how long this has been around and how long it took for this therapy to, to get to where it is today, which is this. And this is one of the kind of seminal uh, studies. This is after many years of development, finally industry took on the brand of TIL therapy and tried to move it to the clinic. And lipholucil is one of the first 
therapies. Uh, and this is showing about a 36% overall response rate in, in patients with melanoma, uh, an 80% disease control rate. And generally speaking, in melanoma, which is the kind of poster child for TIL therapy, you get response rates between 30 and 50%. Fortunately, it hasn't been as effective in other tumor types uh, for reasons I won't go into today, but um, what we know is that this is a pretty impressive response, and there have been multiple studies that have shown this, and actually uh, there was a submission to the FDA, a BLA submission in March of 2023, so this may be FDA approved soon. There was actually uh, a logical question is that if the response rates are so high, could this compete with PD-1 or other checkpoint therapies like CTLA-4? Therapies. This is a trial done in Europe, uh, and, and you can see, compared to ipilimumab at least, tilt therapy seemed to have a higher um, progression-free survival in the long run. And while acute toxicities are much higher with tilt therapy because you know patients undergo cytotoxic chemotherapy as a conditioning regimen, uh, tilt therapy can have to toxicities related to cell therapy, as we see with other forms of cell therapy. The high, uh, the quality of life at six months in this trial was actually better in the the TIL arm. The question also comes up, you know, aren't these the same therapies essentially? PD-1 therapy is harnessing your endogenous T cells and TIL therapy is harnessing your endogenous T cells. So wouldn't the patient's refractory to PD-1 therapy not respond to TIL therapy? When I first thought about this, that's what would have been my hypothesis is that you don't get a lot of, um, it, it's a lot of overlap. And so patients refractory to PD-1 probably aren't going to respond to TIL therapy. Well, that isn't true, actually. There are a lot of patients that are refractory to PD-1 therapy that do respond to TIL therapy. And so understanding exactly why and how that occurs is, is of uh, ongoing interest. So still, we're flying blindly. We don't know what the receptors are and what the targets are for this type of therapy. Um, and now we know kind of what the classes of those antigens are on the tumor cells that could be eliciting this TIL response. Probably the most important one are uh, tumor-specific uh, neoantigens, uh, patient-specific neoantigens, private neoantigens that are selected for each patient. Uh, there are also public neoantigens, mutations like uh, those in KRAS and P53 that can be shared across patients that can serve as uh, uh, substrates for the immune system. There are antigens that are expressed uh, in specific tissues like NYESO and MAJ4. NYESO is a cancer testis antigen, so is MAJ4. There are antigens that uh, are, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the previous one was cancer testis antigens. That these set of three antigens, MART1, GP100, and CEA, are tissue specific. So, for example, melanocyte antigens, MART1, and GP100 um, are, are targeted in melanoma. And there are some genes that are overexpressed. They're not mutated, uh, but overexpressed, like uh, WT1 in, in cancer. And then there are also viral oncoproteins that are not listed here. Those that we see in, uh, for example, HPV-driven uh, squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck and cervix. So we know what the targets are, but we still don't know what the T cell receptor is, but technologies have allowed us to figure this out. So you can go kind of uh, panning for gold or, or fishing. Uh, you use your antigen as a bait, and you can catch the T cells that you're looking for. And once you catch the T cells, we have uh, the technology to sequence the T cell receptor. Once we know the sequence of the T cell receptor, we can then engineer cells uh, with a, a vector and, and endow other T cells with this T cell receptor that has specificity for the cancer. And so comparing TIL and TCR therapy, the source of the T cells in uh, TIL therapy is the tumor. In TCR therapy, you're just using the patient's blood. Uh, in TCR therapy, you need to know the antigen and you need to know the T cell receptor. You need to engineer your cells with that T cell receptor. However, you need to find a patient that has the HLA type that will mat match the, the, the TCR that you're using, so that restricts uh, the patient population somewhat. This is one of the first uh, examples of, of TCR-based therapy targeting MART1, and there's others early on targeting GP100. Regressions were seen, again, on the rate of 20 to 30 percent, but there were severe off-tumor and on-target toxicities in tissue-specific uh, fashion, skin and the eyes. Uh, which are related to the melanocyte targeting of these TCR-based therapies. And that has to do with the fact that TCRs, although they're beautifully specific, they, they do have some degeneracy, meaning the same TCR can identify different uh, peptide MHCs. Uh, people have tried to play with the TCRs. So once you identify a natural TCR, you can mutate it and try to create higher affinity versions of the T cell receptor. But that can 
be tricky because, as I said, TCRs have degeneracy. And so there was trials of a MAGE A3 TCR that resulted in cardiac injury, another one that resulted in gray matter injury in the brain, which was thought to result, be due not to targeting that particular antigen, but a new antigen uh, like Titan in the heart that would, wasn't uh, recognized by the natural TCR but was uh, recognized by the affinity uh, mature TCR. Still, despite a lot of struggles along the way, a FAMI cell is one of the leading candidates to be FDA approved as a TCR therapy. This is a MAGE A4 targeted TCR in the, in the context of HLA A2.1. Uh, synovial sarcoma is probably the poster child for this disease, although melanomas can also express MAGE A4 and some other tumor types, uh, ovarian cancer as well. Uh, this uh, is a, a spider plot showing that, uh, in particular, synovial sarcoma patients respond well to this, and some can have fairly durable responses. This is an affinity-enhanced CCR, so it's not completely natural. It's been modified somewhat from the one that uh, occurs naturally. Um, there were 38 patients in this trial, 16 of them with synovial sarcoma, and 45% uh, of the patients had a, a grade 3 cytopenia or higher, and the best response, again, was in the synovial sarcoma patients. And so this has also been submitted to the FDA uh, as a BLA in, in December of 2022. So these are two therapies, TIL and, and TCR-based therapies, that are on the precipice of uh, FDA approval. Public new engines are a big area of excitement because these are not so specific to sp uh, certain histologies. These, they, you may be able to, for example, target KRAS across GI malignancies and lung cancers uh, if you can find the right mutation and the right TCR. Um, but still, you'll be restricted by HLA subtype. And there have been a few really exciting small uh, case reports of, of TCR engineered therapy targeting public neoantigens like KRAS and P53, even in breast cancer, that have shown remarkable responses in, in, in select patients, but we're still waiting on kind of more broad uh, evidence of this type of therapy being effective. So uh, one of the other kind of derivatives of cell-based TCR therapy are, are um, soluble-based TCR therapies. Um, so we, we've heard about IMTAX, um, and, and these are basically taking the TCR, which is a combination of the alpha and beta chain, uh, and linking that to a molecule that now binds the, the CD3 on an endogenous T cell, so that you join the specificity of the TCR with activity of the endogenous T cell through the CD3 epsilon. And so IMTAC is now FDA approved uh, and, and frequently using the uveal melanoma. So one of the challenges is uh, T cell receptors cannot recognize proteins on, proteins on the surface of cancer cells due to MHC restriction. Um, uh, so, so CAR T cells were, were kind of generated out of this concept that maybe we can target surface proteins independent of the HLA and therefore capture a broader range of cancer types uh, that are and, and in a broader range of patients. And so CARs are basically the uh, single chain FV of an antibody binding domain um, linked to the T cell receptor sequencing domains. Uh, the first antibody based therapeutics were, you know, FDA approved in the late 1990s, uh, but since then, th though they've been used in a variety of applications, but CAR T cells is one of the key ones. And in hematologic malignancies, we all know that they, these are profoundly effective, and this is a long list that I'm not going to go through of the FDA approved ones. But in solid tumors, we're still waiting for that the huge signal. However, uh, I would say in the last couple years, we do have a signal, and they, these can be effective in solid tumors. Uh, I don't think that's, that's um, uh, controversial to say anymore. Uh, the two I'll highlight is the GD2 CAR, which was used in uh, diffuse midline glioma, which is a uniformly lethal disease in, in pediatric population, uh, then in a small study was shown to have radiographic or clinical benefit in nine out of, nine out of ten patients. And if you haven't seen the, the kind of uh, impressive presentation from the clinical trial group that ran this uh, at Stanford, they, they show the videos of the patients who, who were neurologically compromised and for periods of months have a neuro neurologic resolution of their symptoms um, after the CAR T cell therapy, which was given intravenously and then repeated doses intracranially. Uh, Claudin 18.2 is another exciting one in gastric cancer. 
uh, where uh, response rates were on the order of 50 percent. But you know, there are several other targets here. Uh, we, we're collaborating with the folks at City of Hope on the IL-13 receptor alpha-2 car, which was uh, shown some promise in GBM, but also expressed in melanoma. Uh, there's HER2, uh, mesothelia, and PSMA, and prostate cancer. So these are some of the promising targets in the car space in the solid tumors. But there are still barriers, of course, and, and this is kind of a, a slide that you see in, in many talks on T-cell therapies, but the barriers of uh, tumor heterogeneity and antigen escape, uh, the cars actually getting to the tumor and then being suppressed within the tumor microenvironment. Um, one of the things that I think we underestimate is the in vivo access to the antigen. So in hematologic malign malignancies, you inject the CAR T cells and immediately they see their antigen. Um, and so they have that chance to proliferate right away. Uh, whereas in solid tumors, it may take some time to get there and they may not see the antigen to the same degree. Um, and so one of the approaches to, to bypass that is to use mRNA vaccines as a combination with CAR T cells to then deliver the antigen uh, and then you get the, the, the T cells um, uh, expanding right away. Uh, Bispecific T cell engagers are an alternative to CAR T cells by, again, like the MTAX, instead of having to use a cell-based version, you can combine the, CD, the CD3 signaling domain of the endogenous T cell with the antigen recognition of your CAR. And these have been tested. Actually, Amgen is probably leading the way with this with uh, the PSMA, GFRB3, and the DLL uh, targeting in those three cancer types listed. Um, there are some novel CAR designs to overcome obstacles in solid tumors, the, the idea of remote control. So that's the way that I think bites or uh, T cell engagers need to be distinguished from CARs. So in, with the CAR, we have a way of modifying our T cells in iterative fashion. With the bites, you're giving the drug, and then you're just hoping that the drug will do its job. And so um, if we can get to the point where with the CAR we can actually remote control them once the, you've administered them, then you can distinguish them from other drugs where we give the drug and then just wait for a response. So the idea would be that in the green is the patient's endogenous immune cells. You give a TCR or a CAR therapy, and then those are circulating in the system, but now you can give another drug and then modify the activity or the proliferation or whatever you want in the cell so that you have a living drug that you're actually manipulating from the outside, as opposed to other drugs where you give it and just hope for the best. And so this is, I, there are several technologies that are allowing this. Uh, one is, a, for example, a SNP car where the car is linked to a, a, a a sequence that is protease cleavable, and then you can give a protease inhibitor to, to modify the signaling of the CAR T cell. So once the CAR is given to the patients, all you have to do is give a protease inhibitor, and then that changes the biology of the T cell altogether. The other approach are synthetic cytokines that are specific for the T cell that's been engineered. So you create a T cell that will only respond to this drug that will only act on your T cell. So it's like this mutually exclusive pair. So now I give my T cells, my CAR T cells to the patient, and I give this drug on top of that. Uh, company Synthokine is developing this approach using orthogonal cytokine receptors developed from Chris Garcia's lab uh, at Stanford. And so I think that the idea of remote control is kind of one of the next uh, potential avenues to, to dis differentiate CAR T cells or TCR-based T cells from, from uh, bispecific T cell engagers and MTACs, which are uh, a worthy competitor. So, and then lastly, I just want to comment on the differences between CAR and TCR therapies. So a few biological, uh, biologically important points. One is the affinity of the CAR and the TCR. So one uh, thing is a TCR can recognize very few molecules uh, on a cell. Can it recognize a cell with very few molecules of its antigen? Whereas a CAR will require 10 or 100 or even 1,000 fold more of its antigen on the surface. So that's one, one difference. The sensitivity of TCR is much, much higher. That being said, we know more about the strength of the CAR binding and its signaling than the T cell receptor binding and its signaling. So how strong a TCR binds its target doesn't necessarily correlate with how active that T cell receptor is. So the goals for the last 15 minutes, uh, hopefully I, I was able to touch on a few of these major topics, but uh, tilt therapy, TCR, and CAR therapy, highlight some of the obstacles and uh, peek into some of the innovative uh, cell-based biotech that's coming out in the space. Thanks for your time. All right, terrific. Um, I just want to remind the audience, if you have any questions, you can enter them into the online session. Otherwise, we can take them during the panel discussion. And so our next speaker is Stephen Schoenberger, who's a professor 
at the Center for Cancer Immunotherapy at the La Jolla Institute of Immunology and UCSD, and he's going to give us a talk on uh, tumor vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how do we make this work, I guess? All right. I'm going to try and be on time. So, and I thank the, um, the organizers and for making me an MD. This is something that my parents have always wanted, <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm glad I'm finally here. And um, I thank the other speakers because I get to go through some slides quickly because you've already heard some of these things, which is good. Um, some disclosures might be different than you heard. So here's what we're going to do in the next 13 minutes and 30 seconds. And um, everyone in business of immunotherapy should know this, this person, uh, William Coleus, a sarcoma bone surgeon who in the late 1800s noticed an association between bacterial infection of his patient, which is not what you want um, after surgery, and disappearance of the tumor. And so he took the uh, opportunity to actually purposely infect uh, sarcoma with serratia uh, maricens and uh, Staph aureus, and sometimes the tumors went away, and so this was the first immunotherapy. And he got it. That is to mix the innate stimulus with whatever the antigens are. That's very important. It'll be a theme here. Um, I don't think I want to go through this because you all can read um, the timeline. But I do want to thank whoever, uh, actually Kim, who talked about the necessity of integrating the innate arm of the immune system that recognizes features to all classes of microbial pathogens and the adaptive immune system, which is actually going to recognize the neoantigens, which are another theme of this um, presentation. So if you want to vaccinate against a cancer, there's a few things you need to have. One is the source of the antigen that you're seeking to get a T-cell response um, to, and I thank Dr. Mogollon for saying we don't have to mention B-cells here. And there's been different uh, versions of getting the antigen in. Um, protein, peptides, DNA, RNA, including that carried on a, a viral vector, and um, whole, whole tumor cells. And then you need to have an adjuvant because the antigen alone, as we've covered, is not enough to activate an inflammatory immune response. And these are generally targeting the, the TLRs now. This is kind of a, an old slide. Um, I'm hoping that the laser, there we are. And then you have to have um, a vector, or actually, how are you going to deliver the, the, the antigen and then whether it's a needle or a gene gun or inhalation or however you uh, introduce the antigen. So these are the components of a cancer vaccine in all of its forms. Um, we mentioned CYP-T, and this is the first FDA-approved um, cancer vaccine. This was against PAP, and um, then actually some work that uh, Larry Fong did, showing us actually how this works and what it sees and what the immune response is. Um, these are the immunotherapies by different tumor histologies, and only one of them you see as a cancer vaccine. But everybody who uses checkpoint blockade um, knows that this is, these are also cancer vaccines. These are working through the endogenous immune response in that, that uh, patient. And um, we keep improving on, on, on this. This is a, um, a phase three trial that was published last year, and it was in um, tumor lysate-loaded dendritic cells, and there was benefit for the, the patient, as you can see here. The most interesting thing for me that came out of this is stratifying the patients and trying to understand which patients in which disease um, stage and setting derive the most benefit uh, from this. And this is something that, of course, um, is part and parcel of, of medicine when it's done properly. So vaccines implies that you're trying to induce immunity to a specific target. We've covered some of the, the older fashioned uh, targets in the last um, few talks, and those would be tissue-specific differenti differentiation antigens and CT or cancer, uh, cancer testis antigens, which are only expressed in oncofetal life and then again in the tumor. And you can see their various positive and negative features here. Uh, for the subset of cancers that have a viral etiology, those viral oncogenes are valid uh, tumor-specific targets, and things like KRAS that we've spoken about or PI3 kinase are the shared antigens. But the most attention seems to be on these neoantigens, private patient and tumor-specific neoantigens. They're, they're very exciting. They are new because uh, neo, and they're an antigen, something recognized 
by the immune system. There's a lot of energy around these because they're so new. And we know they're new because they were described at Harvard University more than 100 years ago. Um, Dr. Tizer noted that the, uh, it's logical to regard the tumor as a manifestation of somatic mutation, check, and that it should be foreign to the, um, to the other tissues, certainly the immune system. Um, nothing new under the sun. Um, the sources of the neoantigens are anything that can lead to a difference in a, uh, the coding sequence of a protein um, and that it has to be expressed. And so the most numerous are the point mutations, the single nucleotide variants. There are indels that will give you uh, neoorfs or gene fru uh, fusions or splicing variants, and all these will create new, new um, coding sequence, which is available to be a neoantigen. Neoantigens have been, um, I'm sure you, you've read these, these papers, they're um, active in, in um, certain cancers and there have been uh, clinical trials. A lot of these are involving histologies in which checkpoint blockade, which is a, a, a part of, of this, has a single agent uh, signal. So trying to find what's the vaccine versus what's the checkpoint has always been a, a challenge. Um, and identifying the neoantigens, we can all sequence tumors or send it off to um, Tempest and, and understand what mutations are expressed in that, that tumor, but then to identify which subset are actually the neoantigens continues to be a, a, a challenge. If you have the inclination, you can do an unsupervised, unfiltered um, analysis of every single mutation. Um, that's easy to do in, in silico. Functional testing is, is harder. IRBs look, um, look down at complete exsanguination for research purposes. You can also do uh, in silico um, analysis of potential binding to that patient's class one. And then there's this um, extraction of the MHC or HLA bound peptides directly from a tumor sample if you're fortunate enough to, to have enough mass to do that mass spec. And in some cases, um, there will be functional testing. So the thing is this. Um, there are many steps involved in going from a mutation that we can easily identify by sequencing to generate a peptide uh, MHC complex on a tumor cell that directly presents or a dendritic cell. And there's different steps for class two MHC that is um, on those um, cross-presenting APCs. And there are sequence-specific parameters of binding and processing. And so not every mutation can be a neoantigen. And this is where the field computationally has been. What part of these processes do you model and how accurately are you modeling that to um, generate what you think are the neoantigens? And with a computational approach, there's some built-in um, restrictions and efficiencies. And when you superimpose that over the fact that this uh, famous mutatogram shows us that there are different numbers of mutations in different histologies, the highest number of mutations being in the uh, mutagen exposed tissue, and um, not surprisingly, the tissues of which checkpoint has a, a good single agent um, therapeutic index, then I guess the, the, the idea has been that it's probable when the high TMB, less likely or possible, and then not likely in the majority of these cancers that have too low a TMB. And this kind of thinking has guided the field. This is just some uh, papers looking at, uh, the first one is a study about, of, or a survey of 10 uh, studies and 3% of the 10% 10 per, 10 of mutations that scored um, well enough in binding were found to be T cell targets. The mass spec is about the same thing and when you combine mass spec and T cell analysis, the efficiency really drops off. So that means if those numbers are true, there's not much of a chance for immunotherapy for the, um, for the majority of these patients. Um, we soldier on, and the most exciting thing I think that's come up in the last year is the Merck Moderna um, Keynote 942, in which they predicted 34 neoantigens and put them into an RNA, encapsulated that in a lipid, um, a lipid nanoparticle and gave that with Keytruda into post-surgical uh, melanoma 3B through D to uh, stage four patients and um, found that there was a 44% reduction in progression and, um, and death. And a lot of us are really interested to see the immune monitoring on, on, on this to show 
what did the vaccine actually do? Um, but basically, what I want to leave you with is you have to play according to the rules of the immune system to make a vaccine work. And part of that is your antigen has to get to the dendritic cell and be processed and presented and lead to this. That is, neoantigens presented on class one and class two of the same APC. And one of the things that we've been working on with my group is how do you achieve this? And one of the first things that we said is we should know what our targets are. And we don't want to predict. We actually want to validate and verify on a patient-specific basis. So the platform that we've built is shown here. And we are basically um, doing whole exome sequencing and RNA-seq on patients and then using an HLA agnostic algorithm with the idea we'd like to explore whether the uh, reliance on MHC binding is a good thing or a bad thing. So we kick that out. And then we have a functional test in which we draw 50 mils of patient's blood, represent the mutations um, in long peptides that are too long to bind to class one or class two, and then look for interferon gamma or IL-5 in a recall response at uh, day 14. We've been very careful to make sure that we're not priming in vitro and that we uh, are, are seeing something that's real. And we had this first, and then we went back when we found T-cell responses, pre-existing spontaneous T-cell responses in patients with low mutational burden tumors. We went back to the bioinformatics um, team and said, can you figure out bioinformatically knowable features of the metadata um, that comes with the sequencing? And they did, and now we have an upfront bioinformatic prioritization that has about a 42 to 45 percent positive predictive value. We have a trial, and since I'm not going to uh, physician, I'm not going to talk deeply about this, but we hope that we're giving the patients 100 percent verified neoantigens, and we've trained on a number of patients. Um, the thing is, we found patients in every histology that we've looked at that have pre-existing T cells in their PBMC that can recognize their neoantigens, and yes, we've gotten TCRs and verified that these are, are, are real. And this extends to all different kinds of TMBs and tumors, if I can use that imprecise term, and tissue uh, locations. And I imagine your favorite tumor is up here. And so the idea that maybe all the patients that we see have mounted a small immune response to the mutations expressed in their tumor is an exciting one, and can we learn to vaccinate properly and engage those? Um, so the platform, you put in sequencing data and you put in PBMC now, but we're trying to get away from the fact, that, the idea that we have to do this, uh, make a souffle every day of the week. We have um, a personalized cancer vaccine trial. This is the kind of stuff that you show at meetings like this, where a, a recurrent metastatic P16 positive head and neck um, went away. And the T cells were there in this patient. They had just never been asked properly to go attack the um, tumor. Here's a PNET, and this patient was on single-agent Pembro for nine months and still um, progressed, and then we made it a vaccine that had this effect. Uh, we can see stronger T-cell responses after the vaccine for CD4 and for CD8. This is a gastric cancer patient, and what excites me most is that we are seeing a selective disappearance of vaccine-targeted mutations in on-treatment biopsies at the level of, of uh, DNA and RNA, and we're not seeing a concomitant disappearance of uh, housekeeping genes that are not targeted by the vaccine but nonetheless have mutations that we can follow. So the idea that we're seeing immune editing as a consequence of accurately targeted immune pressure in the patients is exciting. Um, we see um, if, if checkpoint blockade works through the endogenous uh, response, Maybe patients who have an endogenous response that looks interesting will respond to the checkpoint. So here's an MSSCRC patient who had um, failed six lines of prior uh, therapy, including those against bony mets. We measured his T cells, and he had good T cells against some drivers. We did off-label ipinevo, and he had a CR that continues to this day. So maybe this is a good biomarker that would predict. So I'm close to being on time. That's good. Cancer vaccines are here and can be effective in the right patients at the right setting. Adjuvant setting seems to be, uh, I think, where they're going to shine. And what we should be working on, in my opinion, is um, accurate neoantigen identification rather than educated guesses. And the formulation and the cost and scalability, because if this is going to move the needle on cancer, 
we, we have to address these things. So thank you for your time and attention. All right, so the um, final presentation of this session will be given by Bridget Keenan, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Hemonc at UCSF, and her talk's going to be focused on targeting the tumor microenvironment. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. I'll just make sure I know how to use this first. Okay, great. All right, I'm here today to tell you about tumor microenvironment and how this can inform challenges as well as opportunities for using immunotherapy. Here are my disclosures. Today, as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about the tumor microenvironment and first of all, why this is important in cancer immunotherapy responses. I'm then gonna give an example, um, a few examples actually, about how we can use tumor microenvironment to use uh, to use this in immunotherapy. And then lastly, I'm gonna talk about conditionally activated molecules. These are um, a way to trigger drugs to become active only at the site of the tumor, and I'll explain more about how that works. We've heard a lot today about tumors and touched on some of these topics, but um, now I wanna tell you a little bit more specifically about thinking about the tumor microenvironment and how this is different than normal tissues. So tumors are made up of multiple components, obviously tumor cells, but also non-immune stromal cells and immune cells. There are the effector cells like T effector cells that we want to be in the tumors. And there are also suppressive components of the immune system like T regulatory cells, many different kinds of myeloid cells, cancer associated fibroblasts. And we also have to consider endothelium and stroma there can be many different signals that are present that are at different concentrations or just unique to the tumor microenvironment. And so these are things like increased hypoxia and glycolysis and acidic pH and different concentrations of metabolic byproducts. We've known for a long time that the tumor microenvironment matters to outcomes on immunotherapy. And here is a paper going back to 2003 in ovarian cancer that shows the, the presence of intratumoral T cells corresponds with better prognosis. And this is not even you know, thinking about necessarily immunotherapy responses, but just overall in patients and how they, um, how they do in terms of overall survival. So here you can see staining for, whoops, sorry, get back. Um, you can see staining for uh, CD3 cells, including both CD4 and CD8 T cells in the tumor microenvironment, that those patients that had higher percentage of infiltrates had better outcomes. Conversely, we also know that suppressive cell types correlate with poor prognosis, and in particular, myeloid cells have been looked at in this context. So I gave two different examples here, but there are many more present in the literature. So first, we can see on the left in pancreatic cancer that the patients with the highest percentage of CD14 monocytes had a worse outcome in terms of survival um, in, uh, with standard of care chemotherapy. And then um, in an immune hot tumor melanoma, myeloid-derived suppressor cells that were quantified by the HLA-DR negative proportion of CD14 cells had lower responses. Um, sorry, there were a low proportion of these cells in the patients um, that clinically responded to immunotherapy versus those that didn't. Another interesting piece of data has come to light recently about the location matters. So the tumor microenvironment is important, but where that microenvironment is, is actually also important. In different tumor types here, um, I've shown in melanoma and in lung cancer, the location of metastases actually correlates with outcomes on immunotherapy and overall survival. And it's been shown that liver metastases in particular versus other areas of metastasis can drive this resistance to immunotherapy. Um, and so this has been shown in multiple tumor types. And here you can see the difference in red with the liver metastases versus um, patients with uh, metastases in any other site besides the liver, such as lung and brain. 
So I think I probably don't need to convince people today that the tumor microenvironment is important, um, but that is just some of the data on why we care about this. So next, we're gonna think about how can we start to uh, make our drugs target the tumor microenvironment to overcome these resistant, uh, the resistance to immunotherapy um, by targeting either different metabolic uh, pathways that are present. So I'm gonna show you an example of one of those um, use, uh, by use of adenosine inhibitors. And then I'm also gonna show you about um, how we could target myeloid cells, one of these suppressive myeloid, uh, immune cell populations. Adenosine is just one of these metabolic byproducts that's at a higher concentration in tumor microenvironment than in normal tissue. So some of you will remember going back to medical school that adenosine is the byproduct of the ATP breakdown. There are multiple enzymes that catalyze this reaction. So CD39 and CD73 are two of the enzymes involved in this pathway. And adenosine, the final breakdown product, can bind to these adenosine receptors here, A2A receptor, there's also an A2B receptor, and that adenosine is suppressive to the immune system. It could signal to T cells and dendritic cells and to suppress these cells. It can also activate T regulatory cells. And one of the pathways it's involved in is angiogenesis. So you can see here that the whole pathway of breakdown is triggered by hypoxia, and the outcome is that there is more VEGF production, and that furthers the cycle of dysregulated angiogenesis. I put red boxes on the components of this pathway, you can see there are several, that have already been targeted in the clinic. So I'm not gonna have time to go into specific examples today of different drugs, but I will talk generally about how adenosine inhibitors have been used, and this includes both inhibitors of CD39 and CD73, as well as um, the receptor, A2A receptor. So overall, these drugs have had pretty modest response rates in the single digits, five to eight percent. In combination with other drugs like checkpoint inhibitors, these response rates have been higher. But I will say, um, you know, we've, we've used these drugs in our clinical trials um, in our immunotherapy clinic, and what we've found is that they can give patients a period of disease control where they have stable disease, and that they are generally very well tolerated. Um, we don't see a lot of the f side effects that are common to other immunotherapy drugs like checkpoint inhibitors or CAR T cells, of course, unless we're using them in combination with one of those therapies. And I pointed out here how tumor biology can help us start to personalize these therapies. So we want to think about every, uh, tumor microenvironment is probably different for different tumor types, and it's also different for individual tumors. Um, and so this is something that hopefully in the future we'll get better at predicting how to use these. But in a couple examples here, I thought about you know, what makes sense to target with these adenosine inhibitors. So in prostate cancer, there is known to be high adenosine production. In renal cell cancer, HIF-1-alpha is an overactive pathway, and in fact, there are already drugs targeting that in RCC. And then in EGFR mutant non-small lung cancer, there is high C73, one of those enzymes involved in the adenosine breakdown pathway. I'm gonna uh, switch topics and focus now on myeloid cells. So here I listed the plethora of drugs that have been available and already used in clinical trials to try to inhibit these myeloid cells. And I will say right off the bat that none of these has been a true success yet. Um, one of the issues is that this is a very heterogeneous group of cells. Um, it is hard to find just one universal receptor or marker we could uh, use to try to inhibit or deplete these cells. And because they are um, a very different group of cells, including macrophages, neutrophils, monocytes, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, um, when you deplete one of these, the other population is gonna take over and fill that role in the tumor microenvironment. So um, there was a lot of excitement around CSF1R inhibitors. However, they have not panned out in the clinic because you are getting these compensatory mechanisms of other cells that um, start to fill that role, that niche. Um, there are other ways to think about doing this that may work a little bit better, and so that would be things like trying to repolarize the cells rather than to just deplete them. And so some of the examples here, you know, things that are very different, um, CD40 agonism, the goal there is actually to turn on antigen-presenting cells and to make them um, better in that role to activate downstream T-cell responses. 
Um, I also wanted to highlight um, what we call the don't eat me signal. Um, so these are signals on the surface of tumor cells that when engaged, they um, prohibit the phagocytosis of tumor cells by antigen presenting cells. And so some of the ideas in that pathway would be to block those signals and then allow macrophages, for example, to um, internalize the tumor cells and uh, kick off an immune response. And lastly, I think one of the most um, novel and exciting ideas in this area about myeloid cells is just think about if we can't get rid of them, how can we just use them to our advantage? And so here we thought about um, one of the ideas in this pathway would be um, to actually develop a CAR macrophage. Oops. <laughs> Okay, going back to that. So uh, this was presented at SITSI last year um, about this idea of using CAR macrophages. This was the first clinical use of this, and the trial is ongoing. Since the time of SITSI last year, there have been about 10 more patients that have been enrolled, but the data is not available for that yet. Um, the idea here is just like we heard about during the uh, CAR T cell section earlier, we could engineer these CARs but put them into macrophages. So the idea is that you could actually get phagocytosis and activation of this T cell response downstream of that, as well as killing of the tumor cell when it's internalized. And then you can also have pro-inflammatory cytokines that are secreted, and they keep that anti-tumor response ongoing in the tumor microenvironment. So the first example of using these was in HER2 expressing cancers, and you can imagine, just like for CAR T cells, these could really be engineered to target anything, um, as long as you're trying to target something that's relatively specific to the tumor to li limit that off-target toxicity. Um, and so far, it looks like they've been well tolerated, and hopefully there will be more clinical data to come in this area. The last part of targeting the tumor microenvironment that I'm going to speak about today is conditionally active molecules. The idea here is that how can we take advantage of specific uh, pathways or metabolites in the tumor microenvironment that are more prominent there than in normal tissues to turn on a drug? There's a couple examples here that I'll show. So one of these ideas is to put some sort of masking peptide on the outside of, for example, a checkpoint inhibitor, CTLA-4. And then this is only cleaved off in the presence of tumor-associated proteases. Very similarly, in the third panel here, you can imagine you could even um, add on to that mechanism by having some sort of um, binding area for a tumor antigen so that further increases the specificity, then you get the protease to break off that blocking peptide and you have the active drug that's exposed within the tumor. And all the time during the systemic circulation, this drug is inactive because of this peptide. There's also a couple other ways we could think about doing this. Um, so in this example here with a bispecific antibody, you can have one end of this bispecific binding to a tumor antigen for here. Here, um, this example shows mesothelin. And on the other side, you could have CD40, which is an agonist. And some of these agonists have been found to have a lot of systemic toxicity um, by overactivating the immune system. So you can imagine that targeting that just to cells in the tumor microenvironment may limit some of that. And then lastly, kind of going back to this idea of metabolism, you could have a drug that is in an inactive conformation until it's in a high enough concentration of something in the tumor microenvironment, for example, ATP, and then you get the active drug. So these are all um, examples that are currently being used in the clinic in a manner of different ways. Here's just one example. Um, there are many to choose from, and this one was a paper that recently came out, so I chose to focus on this. I thought it was interesting and unique in its mechanism that they were targeting, rather than a tumor antigen, FAP, which is something that is ubiquitous in a lot of tumor types because it is present on fibroblasts in the stroma, so you don't necessarily have to have it to be tumor type specific. And then this bispecific on the other end of it binds to 4-1-BB. It's an immune agonist, and it's previously been shown to have a lot of systemic toxicity um, by, you know, when, it, when it's given um, and not targeted to the tumor microenvironment. In this example, um, the drug was given alone or in combination with atezolizumab, and you can see the waterfall plots on the bottom that they did have some responses in monotherapy and more with the combination. And uh, they're, they were using this in a wide variety of tumor types. So you can see here that um, these are, you know, a, a lot of different tumor types that all express FAP. 
And interestingly, um, I would think that tumors with higher FAP expression would be ha have higher response rates, but it seemed like it was um, not dose dependent because you can see here in this plot on the top left that across FAP expression levels, you actually had uh, responses in, um, you know, at various expression levels, and it wasn't necessarily dose dependent, but they did find in all these tumors that there was some level of FAP expression um, where they'd use this drug. So again, many other examples of that, but that was just one I thought was an interesting mechanism. Um, in conclusion, uh, tumor microenvironment has both suppressive elements and activating elements. We want to get effector T cells to the TME and limit the um, suppressive elements like myeloid cells. We can think about this by depleting or inhibiting some of those uh, suppressive populations, but I think even more promising, we could try to repolarize these cells. And in the end, effective immunotherapy likely relies on targeting multiple of these elements rather than just one at a time. Otherwise, that will lead to resistance. Um, and what we, the work we have to do in the future is to figure out which of those combinations are best and in what settings to use those. I'd like to invite the speakers to come up for panel. All right, and if you have uh, questions, um, feel free to enter them into the system. Otherwise, um, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, pose questions in, in person as well. Right. Well, you know, I can start with a, a question, you know, first. I think, um, you know, with all these different approaches, you know, whether they be intra, intratumoral treatments, vaccines, um, you know, thinking about ways of using, for instance, you know, till, till therapies, you know, this whole notion of um, endogenous T cell immune responses, you know, as we've learned with checkpoint inhibition, um, you know, there are terminally exhausted cells, and then there are also the precursor exhausted cells that we think are the cells that are actually responsive to checkpoint inhibition that we think happens in the, perhaps in the lymph nodes or in compartments separate from the tumors. So I'm wondering, you know, with these different approaches that, that we've discussed, you know, to what extent do you think they, they are dependent on those precursor exhausted cells, or are we you know, reinvigorating terminally exhausted cells, or are we actually inducing completely new, you know, naive T cells to elicit a response? <laughs> um, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer at this point, but I, my guess would be that we're reinvigorating cells that have, at some point, you know, been activated in, in vivo, um, unless you're doing the vaccine strategies, which I think Perhaps you actually get some naive cell responses, but until therapy, I, the, the degree of activation that those cells get outside ex vivo, I, I mean, so artificial that it's really hard to know, you know, which which are. But it seems, at least from some of the studies that looked at the population of cells, like the CD39 expressing or CD69 expressing cells that are driving that, are these kind of stem-like or precursor stem-like cells. So I, I would favor that argument. I think in our approach to the vaccine, the functional assay measures what the thymus has already produced. So we're looking at mutations that participate in cross-presentation for which there's a repertoire. Our interest in that is both uh, doing something for those cells, because we don't think looking in the blood, you're going to find the degree of uh, suppressed cells that you would in the micro environment. And for us, it confirms that there is a repertoire repertoire against this um, antigen, and we introduce the information of that neoantigen in the context of a viral infection using, in this case, um, Hiltonol, TLR, um, I'm sorry, um, poly-A, uh, poly-LC-IC. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're doing. So for, the answer is probably both in our, in our case. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, Kim. tumor cell APC hybrids for uh, antigen presentation and vaccine therapy? 
Um, I know it's been tried, and I've, I've seen some work in mouse cells, but it, it um, requires tumor cells and APCs and these materials that are you can do in a, in a research setting to get a, a paper. But as far as being you know field ready, I don't think we're quite there. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you know, there have been a lot of new strategies to try to improve on the checkpoint blockade. And the challenge people run into is, you know, there's incremental improvement. Um, and then often there are clearly some patients who benefit, but then you do that big phase three and then you lose it. Um, do you think it's a selection? If it's a selection, that how would you know which patients would benefit in a setting of, let's say, like a cell therapy? Do you think every patient should benefit from that? And if they're not, why not? I know that's a big question, but um, I think all of you will probably see it in a different lens, and I'd be interested to hear. I mean, so, yeah, definitely running a large trials is wrong. <laughs> I mean, not wrong, you know, of course, we need to have a confirmatory trial. But as we saw just last week from LEAP03, you know, when we, of course, in the early trials, we had uh, somewhat encouraging responses. In other cancers, the therapy is approved. So let's run 670 patients clinical trial, which is completely negative. So clearly it shows, you know, maybe we should think twice before going to a larger trial if we don't have good biomarkers, you know, if we cannot really predict. Should we rather spend a little bit more time on a smaller trial in which we put, a, you know, pay attention to biopsies, analysis, and then this try to enrich somehow. I don't give, I'm not giving you very good solutions. But, you know, try to enrich population of patients that can possibly respond. Since I was talking about intratumoral in, uh, in, uh, therapies, one thing which we probably should be also doing, which might actually move it to the earlier diseases rather than the very late diseases. So um, in case of melanoma, maybe we should think about intratumoral injections for uh, stage one, stage two diseases, be the ones to, to decrease, when the ones when still the immune system is able to some degree control their growth. And this might be uh, more beneficial at the end, you know, than the people who, whose immune system go already got outsmarted by the tumor and they, if they, it grows in other parts of the body. I'm not giving you a good answer, but a little bit, you know, this, I'm giving you my general thoughts about the same issue. I, I can chime in that I'm probably quite biased since I run early phase immunotherapy trials, but you mentioned biomarkers and biopsies, and I think that's why we need to have more of that type of information. I showed a little bit of data, like that was surprising where, you know, they thought that the thing that they're targeting the drug to, the level of that actually didn't even matter. So I think that's just, you know, a small example, but the idea that if we don't really understand the full mechanism of how these work in the tumor and in the blood, then it's hard to think about rolling them out before we're really ready and have a good understanding, or we may be setting ourselves up for failure in a later, you know, larger study. In the cell therapy space, I think the challenge is that, um, you know, running the trials are so difficult and expensive, but you have all these ideas about how to modify a T cell or, or antigens that target. How do we, you know, iteratively do this in a way that's even remotely uh, helpful? So I think one option is to one do kind of pooled approaches uh, to try to accelerate that process, multi-center approaches to do signal finding phase one kind of things in the cell therapy space, where it, historically phase ones are, you know, often single institutions, small studies, but in cell therapy that maybe have to be a little bit different. I think the parameters that guide the success of these therapies are numerous but not infinite, and they're knowable. And we simply have to understand the biology better. Thank you. I had um, a question for, for Bridget, um, you know, talking about the, the tumor microenvironment and, you know, you had highlighted, um, you know, trying to target myeloid cells. And unfortunately, that's been a string of failures in terms of, you know, targeting myeloid cells so far. And so I'm just wondering, 
you know, what, what, where do you think the field needs to go in terms of trying to address that immunosuppressive component in the DME? Mm -hmm. Well, a, a couple comments here. I think, you know, targeting them in, as monotherapy is going to be challenging because if you don't have something like an immune agonist or a checkpoint inhibitor coming in to assist the T cell response, you still might have a failure. So I think the setting for those probably likely does have to be in combination with other therapies. Um, addition, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, the other thing I was going to say is it, it is challenging because we just don't know what is the right signal to target with myeloid cells. They're really heterogeneous. Um, there are so many different types of cells that are present. I think the idea of depleting them really has not borne out in the clinic, and I think it'll really take something that is repolarizing the cell type rather than depleting. Um, but what that actual signal is, I think we, we still don't know. You know, maybe uh, related to that, um, Partos, in, in terms of thinking about like the, the intratumoral interventions that are there, um, some of them have, you know, payloads like with the viruses. Um, um, to what extent do you think those actually are, are necessary or not in terms of actually um, inducing some of the, the responses mm -hmm. that are being seen? So uh, again, you know, the, the approach to intertumoral therapies is also very heterogeneous. We are using these viruses, you know, like herpes virus, which is not only the only one, it's stomatitis virus also, but uh, uh, mainly because they can infect tumor cells. So we want them to infect tumor cells and be able to proliferate within the tumor cells, lead to uh, lysis of tumor cells and release of antigen and stimulation. If we use our TLR9 agonists, we are using, we are really activating antigen presenting cells to improve the presentation, but there's not necessarily an increased release in the antigen. So we know that for immune response to occur, there are several steps, and if any of the steps fails, you cannot get the immune response. So definitely, you know, if we have if we are going to improve antigen presentation or antigen release, but when the T cells go to the tumor environment and they will face PDL1, then they will, no matter how well we did in presentation, they will not do the job. That's why this is kind of what you said, the combinations will be important. So um, we're, within intratumoral therapies are tricky because only the therapies they can give also responses in, in non-injected lesions will possibly lead to success. If you have responses only in injected lesions, this will never be sufficient. Mm -hmm. So hopefully here we have a systemic responses. All right, terrific. Any final questions? If not, we can bring this session to a close and uh, we're now on track for a coffee break, and then um, we'll return at 3.30. Thank you, everyone.